Good morning, and welcome to the Free Enterprise and Democracy Network event, Priorities for Democracy That Delivers, Voices from Emerging Markets. Today, we're reflecting on last week's Summit for Democracy, which involved more than 100 countries, and assessing whether we may actually be at a turning point for democracy. I'm glad you could join us. Wherever you stand on the debates around the state of democracy, you'll gain valuable perspectives from our Free Enterprise and Democracy Network members represented here today. I'm Andrew Wilson, Executive Director of the Center for International Private Enterprise. SIPE has a very distinctive mission of strengthening democracy wherever it intersects with private enterprise and economic development. We had a busy week during the summit last week. On Wednesday, I moderated an official summit day zero event, a private sector forum called Our Business Two: Democracy and Private Enterprise Delivering Together. It was heartening to hear private sector voices represented and speaking out. And at this forum, a diverse set of business leaders made the case for democracy and stressed the need to embrace democratic values. On the same day, our chairman, Greg Lebedev, was a speaker on a National Endowment for Democracy panel, Rebuilding Democratic Momentum, featuring leaders of fellow democracy institutes. Our chairman said that it's not enough to discuss democracy as a lofty, aspirational concept. Rather, we should take the harder path of implementing the less elegant but more important ingredients of democracy, rule of law, accountable public governance, citizen engagement, political participation, gender equity, and a common concern for ethical conduct and environmental stewardship. He described private enterprise as an essential engine and an inescapable partner to do the hard work of building democracy that delivers. How do we translate lofty ideals into hard work and how do we combine the ingredients of democracy into the right recipe? This is where the Free Enterprise and Democracy Network, or FEDIN as we call it, comes in. SIPE supports FEDIN with its more than 60 distinguished members from more than 40 countries as a mechanism for private sector leaders and advocates of freedom to exchange ideas, support one another, and make the case for democratic, prosperous societies. As one of the steering committee members puts it, FEDN provides a helicopter view of challenges and then responds with private sector solutions and policy reforms. To prepare for the Summit for Democracy, the FEDN Secretariat at SIPE put out a call and consulted with members on, three, on the three themes of the uh, summit. Their, their input was compiled into a statement on the state of democracy, which we're launching today. I'd like to summarize selected feature of the network statement and the full statement is available via the homepage for this event. On the first summit theme, defending against authoritarianism, the first thing to note is that power structures and the quality of democratic institutions are affected by economic interests and the governance of the economy, namely, whether there is a concentration of power or a freer, more pluralistic system. The participation of many actors is needed to check authority and initiate grassroots change, and I was deeply struck that multiple members said business is too complacent, blind to the dangers of encroaching authoritarianism until itself becomes the target of repressive regulatory action. And this is coming from experts with a background in business. This should be a wake up call to all of us. As the international projection of authoritarian sharp power, it has an economic dimension and it's called corrosive capital. So I've coined the term and has a major initiative on that subject. Fighting corruption is the second theme, and it stood out as a leading theme of the 2021 Fed and Conference. Certain aspects of anti-corruption are well publicized, such as investigations and enforcement, and more recently, beneficial ownership transparency. In addition, I would point to the importance of reforming regulatory systems that are designed for insiders and which run on rent-seeking behavior. There's hard work to be done in building rule of law systems from judiciaries to public administration and business has a significant role to play and it can be part of a solution when it joins initiatives for business integrity. Human rights, the third summit theme, have been the casualty of creeping authoritarianism. The context of closing civic space has also touched countries regarded as democracies. Independently minded businesses are not immune to being shut down but they have the ability to respect rights within their operations and to enlarge civic space through community engagement. Rights do not only exist within legal frameworks. They gain strength when marginalized communities are economically empowered. 
creating inclusive entrepreneurial opportunity and access to the mainstream economies are key pathways to democracy that delivers and enfranchisement. With that, I hope I've set the stage for our panel discussion and have planted new questions in your minds. A couple of questions that come to mind are, how do things look in particular types of countries? And what do we do about the challenges ahead? I'm certainly interested to hear about these from our expert Fed and panelists. It's now my pleasure to turn to Abdul Wahab al Kibsi, Sykes Managing Director for Programs, who will introduce our panel and lead the discussion. Abdul, over to you. Andrew, thank you very much. You've laid the ground for us. Uh, we're ready to go on the next panel. Um, and I'd like to say good morning, good evening, good afternoon, buenos dias, uh, everything. <laughs> we're now global er everywhere around the world. And I want to welcome everybody today to our free enterprise and democracy networks reflections on the summit for democracy. Our panel today is titled, as Andrew said, Priorities for Democracy that Delivers Voices from Emerging Markets. And um, we're going to go from the helicopter view today down to a deeper dive into some of the global challenges from the Fed and Network's perspective. We're going to go from a global view to how they play out in selected countries and how these priorities might be translated into practice. We'll be hearing about private sector solutions and market reforms to help democracy to deliver. And we've really assembled a fantastic panel uh, for you uh, with a breadth of experience and expertise across careers in the private sector, civil society, and public service. We have three, I hope the third person will be able to join us. Each one of them has an extensive bio. I'm not going to read all of it. I urge you all to try to get access to it. These are really impressive uh, people, uh, like we said, from private sector, civil society, and public service. The first is Claudia Omania Araujo. Uh, uh, she's the president of Fasades in El Salvador. Claudia is a lawyer and legal researcher from El Salvador. She is the first woman president of Fasades which has been ranked among the top 12 in Latin America, according to the Think Tank Initiative. She was founder and former president for 10 years of the NGO Democracy, Transparency, and Justice, which promotes transparency, women's rights, and rule of law. Claudia was also a public servant for almost a decade, working as a director of trade and commercial policy of the Ministry of Economy of El Salvador and the Special Ambassador for Trade Negotiations. Really, I had to be so selective to get you just this paragraph about her, a very extensive, very impressive resume. And uh, next is Cynthia Gabriel. She's the founding director for the Center to Combat Corruption and Cronyism from Malaysia. And uh, another impressive bio, Cynthia is easily recognized as, the key, as a key advocate of human rights and good governance in Malaysia and on the global platform. At the global level, in June, uh, this last June, 2021, at a rare and exceptional invitation by the President of the United Nations General Assembly, Cynthia addressed the plenary of member states at their special session against corruption. Cynthia was appointed into a pres the prestigious Global Future Councils of the World Economic Forum. She was conferred the prestigious Democracy Award by the National Endowment for Democracy at the United States Congress by the Honorable Speaker of the United States House of Representatives, Paul Ryan. At the national level, inside Malaysia, Cynthia in 2020 received a meritorious award by the King of Malaysia for her outstanding efforts in fighting corruption and courage in advancing democratic freedoms in Malaysia and the region. Again, I had to be very selective for a couple of points from her, a very extensive and impressive resume. And last, but not, not, like, not least for sure, is Jorge Botti. I hope he's able to join us soon. He's a Venezuelan entrepreneur with business activity in Venezuela. He is a founding partner of various companies in the field of hardware distribution, telecommunications, and consulting. He was president of Conseco Comereso, a leading organization of national chambers of commerce, and Fede Cámaras, Venezuela's biggest federation of business chambers. He is a renowned speaker and analyst of business and economics in Venezuela, and he's the host of the podcast Hoya de Ruta, Roadmap, an interview space with major local political, business, and social leaders. Welcome, uh, Jorge, 
Claudia and Cynthia, I'm glad you're able to join us this morning. I, I, um, I, like I told everybody, I had to be very selective in what I highlight from your very extensive and impressive resumes. Really, I had to go last night and say, I can't say this. Which ones do I select? It worked out. Welcome. Let me repeat the question. Uh, the first one that was selected by your peers at Fed and to challenge you. They like you a lot, so they want to challenge you. The first one is <laughs> off the summit themes, the three themes, defending against authoritarianism, fighting corruption, and protecting respect for human rights. Which one, if you had to choose, which one is the most urgent? And also tell us why. And like I said before, maybe I'll start with Claudia. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity. I am very honored to be here in this morning. And basically, you ask a very important and existential question. And I would choose definitely defending against authoritarianism because it is the biggest threat to democracy that the world is facing. In order for the countries to respect human rights and fight corruption, you need a solid democratic base. So when we rethink democracy, we have the first thing to know is that we can never give it for granted. And that the key word is trust. We must trust democracy, its institutions, the, the people that are defending it, and we need to work collaboratively. collaboratively. So basically, I would stay with that that is the, the stone in which the other um, fights can be pursued. Thank you very much. Um, Cynthia? Mute. Yes. Uh, are you able to hear me? Yes, now we can. That's great. Uh, it is actually a very big honor to be part of this panel and to assess something of such a global scale, uh, something which, which uh, has tremendous impact on how we're going to be moving forward. So to answer that question, um, it's 10 p.m. over here in Malaysia, by the way, and uh, I think this panel has included very inclusive participation, and I'm really glad that even though I'm like halfway around the world, uh, everything this panel talks about has so much relevance to what we're doing in our work today. So to answer that question about which is the most urgent of the three themes, I have a different take. For me, it's not a question of choice of which one is more important, but about how it's so very intricately linked that if your human rights are taken away because of uh, grand corruption or corrupt practices, uh, we oftentimes find that authoritarianism uh, follows and it's usually authoritarian governments that are corrupt and it is the, these very governments that deny the human rights of its people and i can give you examples of what happened in malaysia during the 1mdb scandal but i'll keep that for a, a question later because it has everything to do with the erosion of democratic institutions when you have corrupt leaders at the top and the, who suffers, who ultimately suffers the impact of large-scale corruption scandals, of uh, money flowing out of the country, and of uh, criminal networks actually operating with law enforcement institutions. So it's really intricately connected. And I think there is a reason why the Summit for Democracy actually placed these three priorities to be addressed at the same time. So uh, that's my take, that you can't have one without the other. And in order to safeguard democracy, you really have to fight corruption and you have to ensure public participation has enough power to scrutinize uh, and hold power to account. Uh, I agree with you, Cynthia. Of course, they're very intertwined and they one depends on the other. But I'm going to come back to you after Jorge and say, if you had limited resources, and you could not address the three of them immediately in Malaysia, where would you start? But I'm going to come back to you with that challenge after we hear from Jorge. Jorge, I don't know if you agree, disagree. Jorge, I don't agree, the, disagree. disagree. You're the, you're. Yes, thank you, Abdul. I hope you all hear me well, and I apologize for the delay and for the technical problems. Uh, I salute everyone from uh, the other side of the world, from Venezuela. Claudia, Cynthia, it is an honor to meet you. 
and uh, an honor to be among you and among so many intelligent women and fighting. Uh, I think I think this is the century of women. Uh, it, I have to agree with Cynthia. That's the thing. Uh, the first thing that came to my mind. They're all very linked together. But uh, my take will be, uh, Abdul, just uh, may maybe I'll get ahead of myself. I think the most important thing that we are um, uh, looking at after the, the Democracy Summit is that uh, uh, the recognition by world leaders and also um, the Western democracies that we have a problem. I mean, the, the first step you have to take in, in, into account is that we have a real problem. We are not dealing with just another uh dictatorships like we dealed in the in the 20th century this is a new phenomenon and uh and i'm very pleased that uh, world leaders especially united states it, it took into account that uh we have to address and to assess this as a very big problem of our times of the 21st century it is it is a different kind of monster that we are facing in this new kind of authoritarianism around the world and uh in in some way they are uh they think that they're winning the battle. So I think we have to grasp all three of them. And, but if I have to choose, of course, I will, I, will, I will say that the most important thing is that for the Western Hemisphere, for democracies and around the world, and for the business community around the world that works in the free world, is to recognize that we have a real huge problem in front of us. Yeah, agree. Um, Cynthia, if you choose, I'm going to come back to you. Of course, they're all important. Of course, they're all intertwined. And of course, we have to address all of them. It's not enough. However, based on the question that was given to me from your uh, colleagues at FedEx, from your peers at FedEx, I want to challenge you to say, if you had limited resources, which one would you address first? Um, democratic institutions would be key to addressing um, corruption and keeping authoritarianism in check. So democratic institutions are central to democracy. Uh, but I'd like to basically follow up from what um, um, Andrew had spoken about just now, uh, which is about democracy and its lofty concepts. Mm -hmm. And this is where the challenge of democracy and democratic institutions come into play. So that would be the first one I would tackle to ensure its independence, that it has enough um, bandwidth, it has enough strength and independence to withstand uh, authoritarian leaders and that it can actually hold power to account. So it is not allowed to be compromised. Political interference is a no-no. And if that can be safeguarded, that would be what I would work on first. Because if we have independent institutions like the judiciary, like a strong independent anti-corruption commission, and, um, you know, central banks that ensure that um, illicit financial flows are not allowed to happen, and that there's sufficient scrutiny, which is strong and independent. You can hold the highest power to account. These democratic institutions are what will hold democracy in check. And this would be what I would work on first. So it isn't among the three, but I would say that it's embedded in the three. And so I would actually target first. Building the institutions of democracy is the number one priority including for the business sector. Claudia, you feel like you want to comment on this? I totally agree that what we need is a, the legitimacy of institutions. And that is why I called upon the key word is trust. Trust, trust a democratic institution that is independent, corruption free, and that it governs in front of the people and not hiding away. Opaque governments create an ecosystem that eventually erodes democracy. So uh, we, I, I like the angle that Cynthia is bringing, and that is the legitimacy. And that is the problem that we've been having in Latin America, that these institutions have not lived up to their expectations. 
And that is why it is so easy to backslide into populism or other uh, negative forms of government because people get frustrated. And out of that frustration comes um, a, the, the need to cut corners. And when people do that, they make the governments get too much power and the concentration of power on its own way then also uh, uh, fosters more corruption. So um, I think that that is a great angle. So I appreciate Cynthia's clarifications. Thank you very much. And your, your uh, input is already generating some interest from the audience. I just want to remind everybody, um, please, if you can submit questions through the Q&A window uh, on the right of the live stream. We have staff that will be calling all of these questions and feeding them so we can ask the participants. And maybe I, will, maybe I will not wait to the end if something comes up. But for now, I'm going to go to the next question that was raised by your peers at, the, at FEDEN. And the second one is um, that Andrew has summarized the, the FEDEN background statement, which you yourselves played a major role in drafting and writing it, and now it's posted online. But um, amongst what you hear of all the issues, what resonates with you? And specifically for you, uh, do the FEDEN concerns connect with your countries, El Salvador, Venezuela, Malaysia, or the region? Please give me the deeper dive. Now we're done with the helicopter view. I want you to dig deeper into your specific countries. And if you can address the private sector concerns also, that would be helpful. I see Jorge excited about this. I'll start with him. You know, there's a lot of resonation. Yes, thank you, Abdul. Actually. I think the statement is very great. I mean, it's a very good work, uh, and it, it, it's it's uh, in, at least in, when I read it from a Venezuelan point of view, and specifically as a businessman myself in Venezuela, I think it it, it has uh, captured the essence of what is going on, and I think that statement also should resonate on political uh, on the political world. It, my main concern, uh, it, Abdul, is uh, the behavior. What is uh, what? Sub, in a part of a small part of the statement is uh, is uh, stating about the uh, it's about the behavior of the business community, uh, complacent or even scared of what's going on. And I think that is a main issue, at least down down here in Venezuela. And I have to confess, also as a businessman myself, I've been in business for two generations. Uh, our business was 50 years old. We were we were uh, we were not uh, taken out by the first part of the uh, the, the Chavista government, but uh, we have to take into account that almost uh, at least half of the business community was wiped out by by, uh, by the revolution by the socialism. Now uh, we st we're still standing, and now it's, in the last three years we have uh, we have had some. Um, turn around how the economy is working. We have uh, free of uh, uh, freedom to to set prices and freedom to 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 uh, ex for exchange rates. And I am very concerned to see that the business community is making uh, some of it at least is making a blind eye. I mean, it's it's not looking for democracy anymore. It's just taking care of business. I think that is the main issue. It is something that we have to address very very deeply. And uh, and uh, and it is not only complacent, as I said, it's also being scared. I mean, you have a very powerful uh, government in place. They are capable of anything. They have uh, they have taken for themselves all institutions. There are no uh, no rule of law and no uh, balance of power. So you just have to remain silent and do not do anything that harms the, their power. This is something that worries me a lot. I am glad that the uh, statement. And, uh, uh, clear it out, and I think that maybe uh, through the, the next uh, participation, the conversation we have to address and to assess on how to change that behavior. How can the business community uh, make a collective uh, alliances with other part of civic society in order to uh, to um, conform? Uh, uh, I mean, a, 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 a more stronger uh, statement. Uh, for uh, for uh, for democracy, Jorge. Uh, uh, really, I agree with you. When I saw the uh, statement, I was struck by the word complacency, 
And you really put it in perspective. When you think of Venezuela and you think of the intimidation that the business community must be going through and the fear that results from that intimidation, it would lead to complacency. I mean, if you're a business person in Venezuela right now, what can you do? And I, we, you, you put it in perspective for me and I thank you for it. It's, it's different, but it's not just in Venezuela. It's not just, it's, I see it in the Middle East. I see it in Central Europe. I see it in many other places where because of the backsliding on democracy, we see that intimidation and the, and the resultant fear from it and the complacency. And I thank you for putting uh, for that for me in perspective. But I'm going to jump to Claudia to see if you agree, if that's the same in El Salvador. Is that the same in the Northern Triangle overall? And, uh, and also, anything else resonates with you and connects? Give us a deeper dive. Yes, um, I would be. I will totally agree with Jorge that for the business community, um, it is very difficult to work in a in a region where the rules can be changed at any moment, and and that is in general a deterrent of the attraction of foreign investment and also for the the investment that is already established in the region in the region in order to you know you, you need to thrive especially in the 21st century and um we must be preparing for the new challenges such as the technological changes that invite us to move from the old to the new economy that should be greener more inclusive and more sustainable most of the energy is just trying to operate in a in a in an environment with changing rules and where it, there are serious setbacks regarding individual freedoms with the stigmatization of uh, critical voices that think different than government. So we believe that social progress entails the promotion of the respect of freedoms of all citizens. And let me go back to an issue that is very important, very dear to my heart. by all of this and let me bring back the theme of that pandemic um mm -hmm. because of that many um there are many business women with small enterprises and unfortunately it need in there needs to be more work regarding the formalization of the economy and um and and other themes that are more complex like domestic violence or unpaid work. And so all of these measures must in general uh, be taken into account because there are a lot of opportunities in this moment in the world uh, with the increase of the supply, uh, I mean, with the uh, chain supply uh, and, and working toward resiliency and to incorporate more of the businesses um into the formal economy and let me also comment on yesterday's um presentation of, of the uh, vice president kamala harris that the relationship between the us and the northern triangle has been very tense it it, it has different um nuances depending on the country but there are opportunities Thank you very much. Um, yeah, we lost a little bit in there, but it's, 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 I'd like to come back to you maybe later and, and maybe Jorge can comment also about how the private sector in particular is dealing with all of this, this, this tense relationship with the United States, the immigration issues and uh, supply chain disruptions, COVID and the pandemic and how that is happening. How's that affecting the private sector in particular and how's that affecting its ability to support and advocate for more democratic reforms. I'll come back to you, but let's move now um, back to um, uh, uh, Malaysia and see, Cynthia, any of these issues resonate with you more? Again, give us a deeper dive from uh, Malaysia and the region overall. Yes, thank you. Actually, there's so much to say about the private sector because the private sector has become such an incredibly important stakeholder in addressing and uh, realizing all of the three uh, priorities of the Democracy Summit. But let me also uh, start by saying that um, there are now concerns of um, state capture, for example, in which the private sector has 
become more powerful than some governments, some poor governments. And it is really the effect of globalization that has allowed cross-border trade, etc. And while that's good, I mean, it, it enhances the economy and provides jobs, etc. There are many instances in which governments bend over backwards, they bend the rules to allow for indirect investment only because they don't want to lose out in our context to Vietnam or China. Uh, and it is like really important for to bring the economy post pandemic back in the setting. So while on the one hand, the private sector doesn't decide to be active stakeholders in determining democracy and democratic principles. I think what it does is it goes with the government of the day. It just wants to do its business and so on. I, the, the issue again of uh, institutions is very important to ensure that when foreign direct investment comes in, private sector, even at the Malaysian level, uh, engages in economy and economic opportunities, there must be conversations around, say, labor rights and the protection of the environment to ensure that climate change is also adhered to and workers' rights are protected. But it is here that governments often, sometimes, well, at least in the case of Malaysia, there are many occasions in which um, that doesn't become an important part of the conversation in free trade agreements or the way in which trade is facilitated into the country. So we have other issues like foreign bribery, uh, cross-border uh, corruption across the supply chain, and many other issues that actually affect the democracy of the people back home and how much money is lost uh, as a result of doing business because private sector also has to pay certain a certain amount under the table but nowadays it's so blatant it's also on the table or over the table you know that that kind of practice which i believe we need more rules uh, as much as we want to ensure that there's standard sops and you don't change the goalposts of how private sector do business there's a lot that needs to be done in terms of um, check and balance uh, for example how do you um, insist that companies don't engage in bribery uh, across the supply chain. What kind of values should we instill in the due diligence, compliance? How can we protect whistleblowers in there? Because whistleblowers are also human rights defenders. They they need a space to be able to lodge complaints, uh, etc. So in many developing countries like Malaysia, which is racing to be developed, uh, many of these issues get compromised and that's where I think the private sector has to also play its role to show leadership by example that it can uh, practice important safeguards to protect the human rights. And if I may, if it's a multinational from the US who has very strong rules uh, in its own country, uh, it has to be applicable with the same rules in whichever third world country it's investing in. So the rules cannot be bent because the people's rights in Malaysia or Venezuela or anywhere else cannot be compromised more than the rights of the people in the United States. And I think that's where this um, cross-border um, engagement and conversations need to be uh, enhanced. And so that's why the Democracy Summit is important. Of course, it's a unilateral initiative and many people have different views on it. But this is a great step to actually involve private sector to, to realize they also have due diligence compliance. They have to protect the rights of workers. They cannot destroy the environment, for example. And at the same time, their rights can also be uh, facilitated in a better way that they, they're clear about the rules, they know that there's no corruption in the in the env business environment and uh, things are clean, ethical, and we may actually then see better democratic institutions uh, performing and not so much affected by economic interests. So that, that statement that uh, Andrew made on authoritarianism for me is very important because if democratic institutions are influenced by economic interests, then we're actually looking at concentration of power around economic interests and stuff. And 
and that's how we got into trouble with the one MDB and all that. But I leave that specific experience for another question because that one just showed how everything felt. Cynthia, uh, thank you very much for raising all these issues. And you um, touched on two things that are dear to my heart as somebody who's been working at SIPE since uh, the early 2000s and things that are drilled down into me in everything that you've said, just two points I want to highlight. And I'd like the uh, Jorge and Claudia to comment if they can. The first one is how everybody thinks, um, a lot of people think of uh, the private sector as a monolith. And you highlighted the issue of state capture. Uh, right, while Jorge addressed the issue of intimidation and fear and complacency. And we're not talking about different size businesses. These are the big businesses, right? The big businesses in Venezuela feel intimidated and they're complacent. And I'm sure the same in El Salvador. While in other places right now, the fear is state capture, right? So that, that private sector cannot be seen as a monolith uh, 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 whatsoever. It's a, the, the private sector is very diverse, very complex, very different. And the other issue you raise is the issue of corruption. And I learned early on at my, in my career at SIPE is that people look at the private sector as either a victim of, of corruption or they see the private sector as a perpetrator of corruption. What we need to see the private sector is as part of the solution, not victim or perpetrator. The private sector can lead on solutions to fight corruption. Again, I'm, I just made my comment on these two issues uh, amongst the other, a lot of things that you raised. Any comment on that from the three of you? I would definitely um, like to comment on that because I like, I like what you're saying because it has to do with agency. It has to do with using the power of creating a job. I totally disagree when people make gener generalizations, like the whole elite is corrupt. That is not true. There are so many just like in government, there are great public servants as well as corrupt servants. Just in the private sector, there are um, businesses that have been very brave, have been operating in the case of El Salvador, even during a wartime, and then trying to rebuild back with whatever is, is left. So I think that there are a lot of very brave people trying to work in very adverse uh, environments. One, that the private enterprise helps the whole country to adopt a good governance agenda. And uh, because I totally believe that, um, and, and the Free Enterprise and Democracy Network is a great example of this, and democracy and development. And one cannot live without the other. You're, you're being a lot. You're, you're, uh, uh, your connection is choppy, and we're losing you in some of the conversation. But please go ahead if you can uh, complete. Go ahead. Yes. So the, the good governance agenda it must include the transparency issues and also a more compliance. Thank you very much. Claudia, we're gonna, I'm going to try to go to Jorge and uh, uh, the organizer, the technical oh, experts behind the connection. Jorge, any comment on that? On that? Uh, yes, I have some comments, but I think I will uh, it's, it's somehow I'll get ahead of myself because I think the next the next issue at hand will be uh, I can address also uh, some of the comments that Cynthia said. And I think she's very she's very right uh, when it comes to building institutions. The problem uh, sometimes is how do you build institutions from inside an authoritarian government? And uh, yeah. it is not it is not impossible. It, it, there's some things it can, you can do. And I think uh, uh, one of the, the, the basic um, uh, compromises that the business community has to make is not only formalization, but also organization. Uh, we have to make um, uh, guilds, the chambers of commerce and um, uh, business associations e uh, a lot more powerful. We have to get united together and to build, to build, uh, we're, I mean, we're stronger together. Uh, we, we can, we can fight. We can even sit down and speak with the higher levels of uh, an autocratic government as has happened in Venezuela. And you can say things face to face. I mean, this is something we have to do. Uh, 
and uh, and it, but you have to remember that, like Cynthia said, that uh, uh, what we're looking forward here is to building uh, maybe step by step is reinstitutionalizing the, uh, the the same authoritarian government getting involved in in the in processes and uh, and how to make alliances with other parts of civil society in order to to uh, to uh, push the authoritarian government into a a, a a scenario where we can work uh democratic issues uh um, at least uh, uh toward the future you see how much hard i can uh, jump in cynthia please jump in cynthia please yeah no i yeah. just uh, no, i just listening yeah. to my listening two colleagues to my... i just thought of another very important uh, aspect of how a private sector can be part of important solutions to promote democracy and fight corruption. In the experience of Malaysia, we do not have a political financing law. So when that whole 1MDB scandal erupted and we and it was discovered by investigative journalists like in the Wall Street Journal that exposed the matter, including the Department of Justice, etc., that 700 million US dollars was banked into the personal bank account of the sitting prime minister at that time. And there was no political financing law to demand uh, how, uh, what's the source of the money, where the money came from, whether it was which private sector or which tycoon actually helped to bank it. And there was, there was no ability to ask these questions. And so we started to work with uh, the Federation of Malaysian Manufacturers and different companies uh, to try to build some kind of advocacy that it would work in their favor if there was a political financing law in the country. Because the Prime Minister at that time had admitted that about 50% uh, of that money was used to win the general elections back in 2013 or four. So that for me, it was a very important point that if there was a political financing law, there were ways in which uh, donations from uh, corporate uh, tycoons, etc., were actually um, registered publicly in some kind of com controller accounts book or something. That would actually help the private sector know uh, that there's these other groups that are also donating. There's no harm donating to a, an opposition political party and the donations need to have limits, etc. And so private sector then, the, the Malaysian manufacturers and their whole federation actually issued a statement to say that a political financing law would be really important for them so that they don't have to keep bribing the government to actually get contracts etc and that they won't actually use that money to win the elections etc so i found that that was actually very empowering that the private sector would come together have a press conference release a statement about political financing laws are critical to combat corruption and promote transparency and develop that whole right to information framework which we don't have here so um something like that towards looking at solutions, because I think, uh, Abdul, you talked about solutions, uh, and it's very important to get there so that we don't look at the private sector as enemies, but that they have a critical role to play in enhancing the, the labor rights of uh, uh, that country, as well as ensuring that there's no foreign bribery, no um, undercounter money that's actually given to governments in exchange for contracts and um, licenses, etc. Absolutely. Thank you very example. much, Cynthia. Thank you. And uh, again, we apologize for the technical difficulties. Uh, Claudia is uh, able to join us uh, back in the session, but she will be only able to join us uh, with voice, no picture. We're sorry we didn't see your picture for now, Claudia, but um, at least we're glad you're able to join the conversation. And I'm going to move right now uh, to one question before I go back to the summit themes and a question on that. A participant asks, Competitive authoritarianism and hybrid regimes offer a nuanced and at times difficult to specify challenge for advocates for democracy. The question to you is, how do you advocate for democracy when the challenge is often varied from case to case and difficult to specify? Claudia had mentioned that earlier about the uncertainty of when the laws changes quickly, when things happen. Anything else you want to add to that? Any of you? Mm, mm, 
I have to say that that it's it's a, it's a, it's a good question. Uh, I'm sure it's in, Cynthia has some comments also, but ah, uh, it it is the kind of things that you you know you step and try to think very deeply about how how to to deal with it because as the question said, it is not only authoritarian authoritarian competitiveness. It's it's, it's something like a new monster. There are elections, but they are often uh, a crooked election. So. But you have to participate anyhow. I think how the, the uh, I think the, the main uh, uh, concern here is how to advocate how the social co the complete social uh, uh, civic society advocate for democracy. We have to act together. That's what I'm feeling. Uh, for mm -hmm. example, the business community in Venezuela has been the public enemy for the last 80 years. I mean, everyone thinks the 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 businesses are are the the the, the uh, are, are are to be blamed for anything uh, that the that the government says is not working. In the last, recent three years, the business community and the religious community, especially specifically the Catholic Church, are the only two actors in Venezuela that have positive uh, uh, that's, uh, that 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 has been. Possibly, positively valued. The only two. All political parties are, are down. All, 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 all the leaders are down. So, I think the responsibility we have right now it's enormous uh, to make a commitment for other than just regulatory uh, 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 the, uh, regulations and problems that have to deal with how businesses work. We have to uh, advocate and work together to to. Make, make sometimes little steps, but uh, that has it has to be at, at least some steps into uh, working for a more uh, open society and to and to uh, watch um, uh, to uh, keep an eye on on, and on on things like human rights, like corruption. Just uh, the, what Cynthia said about the uh, the the uh, the, um, the, finance, the 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 finance the, the way to finance political. Parties, I think it's a great idea, and you, he just she just gave me a great idea to to come into our leaders down here. So uh, it's that, that's the first ideas that come to my mind. That's a successful that's panel a successful already. Panel already. Yes, other, and we'll go try to implement. Thank you, Cynthia. Thank you, Jorge. Can I get a voice check from Claudia? Make sure she's with us, and if you have any comment uh, about about the changing environment and the difficulty to advocate in that ever changing environment. Yes, um, and I would like to add that um, in this very complicated environment, we need to create narratives that connect with the people, communicate in a more empathetic way why democracy matters and what are the consequences of losing it. The danger facing is with this great uncertainty caused by the pandemia and also because of the concentration of power is that we keep acting like in the past. So there is a challenge to reinvent the way that we interact with each other, to adapt with more resilient tools and to be able to connect with more people. Because right now we're losing also the narrative and it seems like or is like when you mentioned that the competitive authoritarianism is taking more. I hope that you were able to listen to me. <laughs> oh, yeah, that are very clear. Thank you very much, Claudia. Anything on this, Cynthia? Yeah, I just wanted to agree that uh, connecting these. Uh, different dimensions with how people look at perspectives is really very important. But one of the other ways um, to address this whole issue of, of fear, uh, authoritarianism, and sometimes that, that feeling of um, helplessness because the government is so strong and so ultimately powerful and in control, uh, is the less elegant way of uh, naming and shaming them. And the Pandora Papers, for example, um, did exactly that. And it was the wonderful work of investigative journalists uh, using technology, crunching data, etc. So in difficult contexts, when you name and shame, um, it could pose as a 
as a way to force leaders to account. You're holding power to account. And that's a very important dimension of uh, uh, enhancing uh, democracy and democratic freedom. So this for me was in powerful because there were a number of countries that then were forced to initiate uh, domestic investigations and that uh, leaders who never bothered to answer for anything suddenly were put into the limelight, caught with their pants down, so to speak. And they had to actually answer for how come they had hidden wealth in so many offshore accounts and stuff. So this is another way that I think civil society needs to scale up a lot of investigative capacities to be able to track, for example, illicit enrichment. Um, how, how And then link back the narratives to how it actually impacts on our human rights, because that money that has been found through ill-gotten gains, et cetera, could have bought more vaccines, could have built more hospitals, could have saved more lives, et cetera. So how do you actually build that kind of narrative? But you can only do that when you have evidence-based data and you have info that is so solid and so substantial that it's able to actually convince masses and people to, to support the upholding of democracy. So that's why those, those vague principles then become real and you're actually able to get answers over how that money flowed out of the country. We could have bought more vaccines with it, etc. So it actually came at a very critical time uh, during the pandemic that we were told of scores of leaders that were actually embarking in um, unsavory activities. But we failed, I, f I feel we failed, at least on the part of the Malaysia and this region, to connect the dots to human rights and democracy. Thank you very much, Cynthia. <clears throat> I want to go to a question also from the audience, but I can't help but comment how Jorge and I got the memo this morning and we dress the same, we have the same glasses, so we have the same hairstyle, so I can't help but comment <laughs> on that. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> The second question is about mandatory environmental and human rights due diligence in the EU on this. Ah, the question went up. Let me see if I can get it back as it's said here. All right. And how the EU looks at the private sector globally on these issues move from voluntary to mandatory on this. The question to you within your own context, within your own regions, is there an appetite for these sorts of mandatory due diligence mechanisms? As we talk about human rights, at that environment, the move on the private sector side to make it That's mandatory fine. is not voluntary. Is there an appetite for it in your in your region? I would believe that for mandatory, um, I, not really. I think it's more on an individual uh, basis. I think that at least for the Northern Triangle, if if it were to go mandatory, it would create also an adverse uh, environment for the adoptions. So I think that we should uh, promote the voluntary uh, and then work from there. Yeah. But um, right now, it seems like like uh, there is this. This doesn't look like a public policy. Right now, it seems more on a voluntary matter that it could have a better effect in an early adoption and also have more incentives regarding the benefits. Thank you. Cynthia in the case of In the case of Malaysia, there is something mandatory. Uh, it was just introduced in June uh, last year, 2020, where um, there is a provision incorporated into the Anti-Corruption Act which compels um, directors and top management leaders to uh, ensure that across the supply chain there's no uh, bribery that takes place in uh, securing contracts, uh, bids, and uh, actually getting uh, procurement uh, goods and services done uh, with without uh, bribery. So if there was, uh, there's a strict liability provision that uh, 
makes them uh, guilty of the offence unless they can show that they have actually incorporated proper due diligence, compliance, and at the heart of it, whistleblower protection. So, which means that that's the only way to get out of this. Um, so, it, here we have something called the corporate will that uh, company directors are always protected. So, right now with Section 17A of the uh, Anti-Corruption Act, companies are now compelled to institute systems and mechanisms in their respective companies to uh, ensure that bribery doesn't take place. So it's mandatory now for even SMEs, uh, which are now struggling to uh, prepare themselves against the law, uh, just in case there's someone in their rank and file. And worse, if there was a middleman agency that had committed bribery, the directors would then be liable. So it's quite effective. It's actually modelled after Section 7 of the UK uh, Anti-Bribery Act, the uh, uh, British Anti-Bribery Act. And it has actually kind of instilled some kind of uh, urgency and fear in the private sector to to scale up their, their um, rules and their compliance system. So there's a lot of opportunity now to work with SMEs to help them get ready. Of course, the bigger companies actually have integrity officers, due diligence staff, and an entire unit for integrity and all that. But when it's made mandatory, we, we could actually see the urgency, the rush. Everybody is like trying to find a way to just develop something. And that's the opportunity to really showcase uh, how private sector actually needs to ensure they don't engage in any more uh, rent seeking, uh, bribery type of activities to, to gain contracts. Mm. Interesting. Thank you. I don't know the context of Venezuela, uh, how this would work. Uh, Jorge, you want to comment? No, I don't know how that you know, actually, actually, Abdul, I was. <laughs> I have to say that myself, I, I, I'm not quite aware that we have any kind of regulations. The only, the only one is uh, related to the the legitimation of drug uh, money or something like that. That you have to make some statements uh, with the banks every time you move money, but. Uh, it, it is so. I have to say, it's almost like a joke. I mean, I, I don't think there's any kind of regulation. And and uh, to be honest, other than the main businesses, the own businesses self-regulating and trying to control their value change, I would say Venezuela is just like a. I don't know. It's an a. It's an open territory. It has everything to be done uh, right it's now. Uh, and, and I agree somehow with Claudia. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Just let me. Clarify because I mean, um, it, just to have the proportions of things. In the case of El Salvador, send seventy percent of all businesses are, are informal. So um, the thirty percent that are formal are very well sure. regulated. I'll, I'll move on. We only have on. we only have or so. I'm going to ask you to be brief. Two questions, and I'm going to prioritize them to my own questions that I have here. But I will prioritize the questions from the from the participants. One, the first one is uh, another scary phenomenon. In addition to complacency from the private sector, is overall trust in democracy and traditional uh, liberal institutions is eroding worldwide. That's that's a scary phenomenon. How do we use private sector, or how do we work with the private, utilize private sector to work with civic organizations? and other stakeholders to restore some of that trust. Are there any new models or examples that are effective? And I'm going to add to that the second question was somehow related, and this one sent from Natalia, that says, how can private sector be more effective at building alliances with the wider civil society on addressing major challenges to democracies, including anti-corruption, kleptocracy, uh, and uh, that sustain authoritarians? Do you have good examples specifically from your country? So one is on trust in business, and working with others. The other one is specifically on building coalitions and working with the wider civil society. And I'm going to open up to anybody who wants to start first. Jorge? I don't know. Cynthia, maybe you go first. <laughs> okay, Cynthia. <laughs> well, I think um, there, there's a lot of opportunity for capacity building and training in, in the context of what I just described just now around um, 
due diligence systems to incorporate whistleblower protection, look at anti-corruption measures because of the new corporate liability provision. So that's one direct angle and uh, that is something that is a new opportunity and something that we actually have uh, scope to develop. Uh, the other is, uh, I think, working around improving competition policies. Uh, why do I say that? Because in our country, for example, you have a very strong presence of uh, state-owned enterprises, so in which government actually has a majority stake in companies. So they own those companies because the government wants to engage in business directly. So the whole question about whether government should be facilitator or are they active uh, agents of uh, taking part in business? So we have always advocated the fact that um, government should not be directly engaged in business per se, but these state-owned enterprises sometimes deprive private sector of real opportunities to win uh, procurement bids, etc. So enhancing competition policy is a very important part of corporate governance. And that could be something that civil society can work with uh, the private sector in important ways to develop good, good strong guidelines. And I, 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 there is another aspect, the one that the UN Global Compact actually keeps working on and the open government, open government partnership, where there is a relationship between government, civil society and the private sector to start looking at more open frameworks around uh, developing data sets, open data sets around uh, how a contract is implemented, how much money is actually um, needed to finance a particular project and different stages of the project etc should be uh, already displayed on websites etc and this is where civil society can actually uh, work with in constructive uh, measures to uh, help companies also develop data sets and, and stuff if they're willing of course if they have a whole section on uh, looking at open data mechanisms and policies so there, there, there are things that I think we can pursue but it's also our own readiness and capacities to be able to uh, build better linkages and better ways in which we can engage with the private sector but just one last comment if the government is really difficult, like in the case of, uh, like was in the case of Malaysia and in currently in certain countries in Latin America and uh, in Venezuela and all that, it would be quite difficult for the private sector to directly link with civil society because of that, that, that culture of uncertainty and fear and whether doing that would actually endanger their economic interest. So that's why a more transparent framework is actually needed on um, uh, investments, role of civil society, and um, uh, a lot that the UN and international organizations can assist in this direction. Thank you, Cynthia. I hope I had your, your um, conviction on this. I, I have my doubts about it, but all right. <laughs> Yes, uh, the first thing I have to say is that uh, about Venezuela and regarding your question is, and my concerns also, uh, is that the government is broke, has gone absolutely broke. Everything that moves and it's standing and working in Venezuela is because of the private sector has been investing and in, in, uh, putting it, putting it the best efforts to, to keep the country running. Around 90% of the population is poor. More than more than 60, 65 percent of the private sector is, is in formal sector. So my concern uh, right now, Abdul, is uh, but I'm 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 watching it uh, as we go in, in my day to day work. Is that the people are starting to uh, realize that uh, they do not need the government to 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 go through life. I mean. There's a lot of people that has been gaining uh, now a lot more than uh, they used to be the the normal salary when they work for the for the public sector, and they're starting. I think they're. I think the main concern is that they do not believe that democracy does any good for them. They just want to live their lives, and especially the young people. And I think that it's not only about Venezuela. Uh, 
in I think one of the, the one of the things we have to to uh, to, to rethink in the in, in in the private sector, but also in the political arena, is how do democracy deliver for the normal people in their normal life? That is something that's 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 uh, I think it's in the head of, of, of I don't know Chinese people or maybe a Russian uh, uh, that they just they're, they're just living their day to day their their work is, uh, is is their life is somehow getting along but they do not connect that life with with the need for freedoms and the need for for democracy. So I think what the, that the private sector the business community has to uh, has to do some stronger efforts uh, to to connect as i said before with other civic um, uh, actors uh, labor unions um, religious uh, leaders uh, academic uh, um, actors i mean the getting involved in education and teaching about how democracy works better for people I think it's one of the works that that and, and creating a new narrative, like Claudia said before. Said before, I think it's one of the it's on the top of the priorities right now. People believe that democracy is no longer good for them. It does not any any it does not does not do anything better than their way their, their day to day life. I think that is a great challenge we have ahead of us. Jorge, but, um, <laughs> that is very, very sad, Jorge. <laughs> and, yeah. and let me tell you something. It really touches my heart. So let's bring to the table the conversation that democracy matters in this new digital area. And this is uh, a big challenge. And I think that we need to create greater sources of information because um Even we don't even are sharing the same facts. And I believe that what Jorge said about the youth, we need to create that what, what it means to be a citizen, a cyber citizen, citizens that has voice in this cyberspace. And uh, what distinguishes the, pre the present day is that technology is changing the relationships of power. And there are an overwhelming amount of information available. And there is just no way to consume it and organize it. And so there is this economy of, of attention. How do we capture it? How do we make democracy be of general interest? And uh, I think that we, all of the, all of the uh, human rights defenders, independent media, civil society needs to come together and to create information in an organized way uh, with legitimacy. And we need to know that we're not talking to ourselves, uh, that we are not our own sounding boards. Yeah. Um, uh, we're not going to take any more audience questions. I have one final question here. I'm going to ask you to be brief maybe uh, two to three minutes each. And then if you have any final comments you want to add, I urge you to do that. The last question I have for you today is, you know, we've all been following the conversations around the summit and even outside of the summit on democratic backsliding in general. Democracy is in a dangerous place these days. We all understand the threat you know, uh, to democracy is more than I've seen it in my uh, 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 lifetime working on democracy, at least. Um, uh, but... If we follow with the discussion about the, th the themes around democracy and what else we're talking about, from your own perspective, what are we missing? What are we missing on this discussion? Is there a pivotal issue that has not, has not been discussed, that we need to discuss? Do we need to change the way we're thinking? Why is it not working? Why are we backsliding? Why are we losing that battle? Is there something we're missing, especially on the theme of democracy that delivers? What aren't we delivering and how can we help Help me out. What are we missing? What's not there? And uh, again, feel free to give me your final comments with this. And uh, this will be the last question I ask. Go ahead. Anybody can jump first. Let me go first this time. Uh, I had the same concerns, Abdul, and, I, and I, I'm really worried about what's going on in the world. I mean, I think at the risk of being too simple, I think that we're what we're really uh, missing is that somehow 
the economy and the life, the, 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 the normal life of the people has been uh, m moving in a different direction than what the, the uh, political world has, has been moving. And like, like Claudia said, we have, we have great challenges in front of us. The, the technology, the, the fourth industrial revolution. I mean, uh, ever since China in, uh, in the late 80s and, uh, and in the 90s, Starting started that path uh, for the free economy for the mixed models with uh, economic freedoms. I quote, and but no political rights. I've I've, I've I've been hearing again and again that it will not work. That it will somehow crash. That uh, as soon as millions and millions of people have gone out of poverty, just like Chinese have have been doing for the last uh, twenty to thirty years. They will start. The, those human beings will start to 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 reclaim back their their uh, individual freedoms, and and uh, and we are. I think we are just sitting, expecting for that to happen, and it's not happening. It's not happening in in, in Belarusia. It is not happening in in Vietnam. It is not happening everywhere that the economy has been working. Uh, uh, working for the people that uh, the, the 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 economy has been gro growing, but there are not no uh, political or individual freedoms, and I think this is a very a very big issue we have to address. Why is that happening, and how can we uh, build a, a, another a, a, another connection with the reality that's going on with the people, and how can the democracy deliver better be, a, a, a better way of life for them. I mean, I don't have the answer to that. But when I when I speak to my colleagues, when I speak to my workers at, at, at the uh, at, at, my, at my business, it, it seems that uh, they only uh, they, they, they only uh, they're, they're just uh, wanting to uh, they want a more material world to to uh, material goods to be uh, to be uh, living, but they're, they're not concerned about how freedoms connect to them, and I think we're missing some of somehow how to reconnect the democracy with the common people. And I think the the public, the private sector, has a lot to do on that. And uh, there, of course, we have to 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 commit with it. And uh, to, and as I said many times before, we have to to build and come together with alliances of other civil civil uh, actors in in the, in our community. Thank you, Jorge. And it's, it's ironic, the time person of the year just came out. Elon Musk was the person of the year. For me, it'd be the Venezuelan private sector. You guys are doing an amazing, amazing job. Without Venezuelan private sector, I don't know where Venezuela would be. Um, Claudia, anything to add, please? Yes, I think that we, um, we're losing a lot, a many, too many voices uh, in the process. And we need... Um, to let the youth, the women of all of these countries know that there are opportunities here. All right, uh, Cynthia, please. Um, I just wanted to pick up from what uh, George mentioned just now. Uh, one, one element that I think we are completely missing is uh, uh, what is it that really matters to people, especially those that languish in poverty? It's the bread and butter issues. It's about jobs, it's about surviving, it's about ensuring there's food on the table on a day-to-day -day basis. But when you speak about lofty principles or democratic values, I'm not discounting that it's not important, but it just doesn't connect. And Claudia's point about narratives are really important. How, how does it matter? And how does it deliver? So in our context, there's always this joke because we're squeezed between India and China, two most populous nations in the world with completely different styles of managing populations. So, you know, China, for everything that we say and uh, know about them, uh, they're a very efficient nation. So, and there's very, very little notion of what democracy is there, as we all know. But... They have better roads, they have better opportunities for jobs, they have a uh, better uh, way of managing um, many things. 
as opposed to India, the joke is you talk too much, there's too much democracy, and then it doesn't move anywhere. So that's a joke here. So what do we do? Which system do we follow? The smaller countries in between China and India, which is a better modus operandi? So that for me, that question is what kind of democracy delivers? Is something that we have to answer from the needs of the people. So in Malaysia, there are many human rights groups that focus on civil liberties. But there are less and less and less that focus on economic, social, cultural rights, for example. Maybe because it's less tangible, but how do you make economic rights the center of um, democratic freedoms and economic freedoms, etc.? Because that is how we can connect uh, uh, bread and butter issues with human rights issues and democratic values. And why is it important for poor people to actually know what is allocated for them in the budget and whether they actually receive any money at the end of it. How do they track? How can they actually ask the right questions to the, to the um, you know, um, official, officials in the rural areas that are meant to allocate the funds, etc. So the empowerment is actually very important and this empowerment is what I feel we're missing. Uh, we're talking values and principles rather than connecting it with a uh, community. My other point is about um, the bigger challenges of cross-border um, issues, uh, criminal networks, uh, cross-border corruption, cross-border crimes, and how governments actually are not quite and this is a sweeping statement, I know, but I don't believe that democracy is a priority for them. But it's more uh, profiteering, mm -hmm. how to get money. And that priority is not about profiteering in order to feed the people, but it is profiteering for themselves. So this is part of the problem, and that's why we have to stand up as civil society, as community groups, we have to stand up and actually uh, hold power to account. For me, that is central in preserving our democratic values. Thank you very much, Cynthia. Um, yeah, stand up is the is the action here. Uh, but before I conclude, first of all, let me apologize for the technical difficulties beyond our hands. I want to thank you. Don't know how much work background work has been <laughs> uh, going on through this uh, uh, panel to make sure to try at least to uh, uh, get uh, the voice and the, the audio and the picture and all of that. So again, apologies. But I hope that you all agree with me that our panelists have really awakened us today. They awakened us to critical areas needing attention and they are truly inspirational. So thank you very much. Thank you, Claudia. Thank you, Cynthia. Thank you, Jorge. On behalf of everybody, really, I want to thank you. Um, but let me conclude by saying that the uh, Summit for Democracy has been a whirlwind of events, creating a lot of energy and leaving us to wonder what comes next. We won't fix democracy in a year, yet 2022 promises to be a pivotal year in the fight for democracy. It will be a time to defend institutions at risk, to build alliances within and across countries, and to proclaim democratic values while simultaneously taking an honest look at our own imperfect system. SIP will be committing itself to building resilient democracies and economies, promoting inclusive democracies and markets, and cultivating sustainable networks of change agents, including FEDEN. Meanwhile, FEDEN will be committing itself to communicating the value of democracy that delivers the freedom and opportunity for all to prosper. FEDEN will demonstrate where and how the private sector and civil society can build bridges and engage in collective action to achieve credible solutions. I'm inspired by what, by what members are already doing. Witness the Fair Play Initiative for Responsible Business, led by the Institute for Private Enterprise and Democracy in Poland, or the work on innovative co-regulation of the digital economy by the Center for Indonesian Policy Studies or the Coalition Advocacy for Small and Medium Enterprises to Achieve COVID Relief, led by the Lagos Chamber of Commerce and Industry. What will you do in 2022 to support democracy? Whatever your country and whatever your th uh, thematic focus, 
I hope that you will take to heart the priorities in Fed's statement on the summer themes and that you will see new opportunities to build bridges for more democratic society. I want to thank Dr. Kim Betcher, my colleague, the head of policy and program learning department. I want to thank our communications department today, led by Pamela Kelly Lauder and her team. I want to thank our folks at Event Mobi who made this uh, uh, possible today with all the difficulties. I want to thank you again for joining us today. Please continue to follow FEDEN, and we hope to see you next time.